Hey boys, how we doing? Are we good? Monday night, 9.30, let's go. Uh, it is great to be here. Uh, I don't think I know any of you, and you probably don't know me, so I'll introduce myself. I'm Clay Smith, and I pastor Johnson Ferry uh, Baptist Church, which is in Atlanta. And we're grateful to be here. My wife, Terica, uh, Terica's right over here. So uh, we're here, we're grateful to be here tonight. And uh, love my wife, love my family. We got three girls. Y'all pray for me. A lot of feelings in the house. Um, but I got three daughters who I love very much. And just excited to see you guys tonight. I think back to when I was uh, doing my undergrad. I went to the University of South Carolina and was not living for the Lord at all. And so it does, it does my heart so good just to see a sea of, of people that are passionate about Jesus. And I know that's not true of everybody here. I mean, some of y'all are faking it just because that's, that's how it rolls. I mean, let's be honest, like our hearts are not always attuned to the things of the Lord, but a lot of you are. And it is so encouraging to be here. What a privilege it is to be here tonight. I, I want to take you into the Word, and I'll be honest with you, I, I prayed about what to talk about, and I don't want to be one of those pastors that just kind of re-preaches what I preached yesterday. Uh, but at the same time, this might be an epic fail, so we'll see how this goes. But I, I picked the most random story in the Bible that I want to talk to you about tonight, and it's for a reason, and it's found in the book of Judges. Judges chapter 11. That's the really clean part of your body uh, Bible on the left. So go over there uh, to Judges chapter 11. And I don't know what version you, you tend to read or tend to hear. Uh, I use the New American Standard, so it may sound a little different than what you have in front of you. But Judges chapter 11, and there's a reason I want to talk about this, because I think it's incredibly relevant to, to why you're here. And, and that's the first question that I would want to ask you, why are you here? I don't mean tonight in this gathering, but why did you come to Boyce College. What was your intent? A.W. Tozer, who is a, a name that is kind of falling off into the echoes of history, he, he said this, he said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. And I wonder what comes into your mind when you think about God. I think that's actually related to why you're here and why God wants you to be here. Now, we're going to do kind of a, a long way around to get to that question, and I want to do it by looking at this story in Judges 11, where God yet again delivers His people. If you've never studied Judges, it's a fascinating book, and what we see in Judges is really this cycle that, that goes again and again and again. There's different ways to talk about the cycle. I had someone tell it to me in a way that has always stuck with me, A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E, said that what you see in Judges is that the people of God commit apostasy, that's the A, it then puts them into a place of bondage, usually to a foreign leader. The C stands for that they cry out to God. The D is that God gives them a deliverer. And then for a certain period of time, there is ease in the land. And when we read the book of Judges and we see this cycle over and over again, there's part of you that thinks, what, what is wrong with you? How, how can you keep doing the same thing again and again and again and again and again? But then you look into the mirror, and even those of us who are born again, followers of Jesus, we can lapse into the same things again and again and again. God gave His people deliverance, and He does it through leaders. The particular judge in this story is a judge by the name of, of Jephthah. Now, when I say judge, because I don't know how much you know about the book of Judges, don't, don't tend to think about in our American legal system someone wearing a black robe sitting in a courtroom. A judge is another way of just talking about deliverer, some kind of leader that God sends to rescue His people. And he does it yet again as the Israelites come up against one of their big foes, the Ammonites. They had really two on either side. You had the Philistines on one side, 
and the Ammonites on the other. So this is a story about Israel at war with the Ammonites, and I think this is actually relevant to you and to why you're here at Boyce College. So let's look at it together. We're going to start back in chapter 10, verse 13 and 14, just sets the scene for us. God says this to his people, yet you abandoned me and served other gods, therefore I will no longer save you. Verse 14, God says, go and cry out to the gods which you have chosen. Let them save you in the time of your distress. God has had enough. Now he's a God of grace, but he also judges his people to shape them to follow him. You know, sometimes people say things like, What's up with the Bible? How come, how come in the Old Testament God, well, how come in the New Testament He seems so loving and forgiving, but in the Old Testament He seems so grumpy and vengeful? You ever had anybody ask you that kind of question? And the only reason that they would say that about God, particularly in the, in the Old Testament, is because they've never read it. Because what we do actually see in the Old Testament is we see the grace of God again and again. So many chances He gives to His people. So, They have worshipped other gods. God comes and he shows them his grace. And he does it through giving them a a deliverer by the name of Jephthah. So let's learn who this is. Verse 1 of chapter 11. Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a valiant warrior. But he was the son of a prostitute. And Gilead had fathered Jephthah. Gilead's wife bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, You shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. And worthless men gathered around Jephthah, and they went wherever he did. God doesn't produce leaders like cars are produced in a factory. God is a creative genius. Some of God's leaders are warriors. Some of them are singers. Some are thinkers. Some are negotiators. Some are slaves. God makes each one of his leaders different. God doesn't use copycats. You know, I think that's what's amazing, that God made all of you unique to who you are, and God tends to use you in who you are to make a difference for him. This particular leader, Jephthah, is what my text translates in verse 1, is a warrior. He's uh, He's a brawler. But he's got a big problem. What's the problem? Verse 1, but he was the son of a prostitute. His dad, Gilead, cheated on his wife, had a baby with the prostitute, and nine months later, here's Jephthah. Now, yes, he was of his father's bloodline, but can you imagine how much he was made fun of as a child? You're you're not of our house. She's not our mother. You're not entitled to the inheritance. And so it says that he goes out and he he joins a band of, I love how mine just says it, it says of worthless men. Worthless men. I, I think that I can identify with that uh, probably when I was Jephthah's age, I don't know how old he is, but I imagine he was, a, he was a young man, maybe early 20s, late teens. I think I attracted a lot of worthless men. You know, guys in my life that were not pursuing the things of Jesus. And I think the reason that, Gil- that uh, Jephthah did is because this is a place that unfortunately he found belonging instead of where he should have found it, and that is with his people, with his family. But these skills are going to come into great use because God's going to use his warrior-like status, his negotiating power to make a difference for Israel. So verse 4. Now it came about after a while that the sons of Ammon fought against Israel. When the sons of Ammon fought against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, come and be our leader that we may fight against the sons of Ammon. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, did, did you not hate me and drive me from my father's house? So why have you come to me now when you are in trouble? Hold on, don't you just know this felt so good for Jephthah? I mean, this is, this is his moment. 
His whole life, he's been an outcast. His whole life, they pushed him out until they needed him. And this is the moment that they needed him. This is his moment. And they come to him and want him to be their leader. Look in verse 8. The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, For this reason we have now returned to you, that you may go with us and fight the sons of Ammon, and check this out, and become our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. They, They are offering him not just military leadership, but political leadership. You are going to be in charge if you can win this battle for us. Well, Jephthah's not dumb, and he's able to think pretty quickly on his feet. And so verse 9, Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you bring me back to fight against the sons of Ammon and the Lord gives them up to me, will I become your head? Just making sure. Verse 10 and 11. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, The Lord is witness between us. Be assured we will do as you have said. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mitzvah. Now, one of the key themes of this story is the power of words and how words have power to bring about great results and, unfortunately, tragic results. With their words, they make him the leader. Jephthah is going to have his own struggle with words to come. But one of the lessons that we get just right off the bat from the leaders is that they're making a very emotional decision. They're in, a, they're in a bind, and they need help, and they make an emotional decision. You know, often you will make some of the worst decisions of your life when you are heated with emotion. I mean, we've all done it, right? You, just, you send that text, and you wish you could take it back. You know, you're hitting that, like, delete button as soon as you can, but you know they saw it. We often let our emotions and our words get the best of us. So what I'm going to do here is just paraphrase 12 through 27, but at this point, Jephthah then puts on his negotiating skills. And, and he goes to those in Ammon, and really he's going to make three arguments in his case, all right? You're the jury. He's going to make these arguments to see if, if you agree with him and, and why uh, Ammon should basically leave them alone. The first is history. And he goes back to Israel's history and says, back, back hundreds of years ago when God delivered Israel from Egypt and we were walking through the wilderness on the way to the promised land, uh, we tried to go around Ammon, not wanting to get into a war, but Ammon did not believe that and they attacked us. So any kind of long-standing bitterness, resentment between Ammon and Israel is not Israel's fault. It's, it's Ammon's fault. We, we did not pick a battle with you. You did it with us. And then he talks about theology. I will just show you verse 24 of chapter 11. He makes this case. He says, do you not possess what Chemosh, your God, gives you to possess? So whatever the Lord our God has dispossessed before us, we will possess it. In other words, he's saying, look, if, if you guys follow Chemosh, your God, and if he gives you land, then you take it. But obviously, we follow Yahweh, and he gave us this land. This is our land. He's using a theological, though I think it's a, a rudimentary theological argument, but a theological argument. And then he just goes to pure reason. In verse 26 and 27, he says, While Israel was living in Heshbon and its villages, and the Aror and its villages, and in all the cities that are on the banks of Arnon, 300 years, why did you not recover them within that time? It would be like if, uh, you know, where I live in Georgia, uh, we have a lot of wonderful tributes to Native Americans, and I'm just fascinated with that culture. But if, Na- if Native Americans said, you know what, we, we want this country back because you stole the land from us, one of the arguments would be, well, where would you begin? I mean, a lot of time has passed. Where, where would you begin to even make something like that happen? And that's what Jephthah's saying. It's been 300 years. So Jephthah reasons with them, hoping diplomacy works, but will it? Look at verse 28. But the king of the sons of Ammon disregarded the message which Jephthah sent him. Diplomacy didn't work, so Jephthah's going to have to do what he's really good at. 
and that is fighting. So his second strategy is now war. One time I saw a, a bumper sticker on a car. It said something like this, there is no problem that cannot be solved by the use of high explosives. I don't know what they meant by that, but maybe Jephthah got it. Verse 29, now the spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah and he passed through Gilead and Manasseh. Then he passed through Mitzpah of Gilead and from Mitzpah of Gilead, he went on to the sons of Ammon. And then then look what he does here in verse 30. Remember I told you earlier about the power of words? Look at this verse 30. For whatever reason, Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will indeed hand over to me the sons of Ammon, then whatever comes out the doors of my house to meet me when I return safely from the sons of Ammon, it shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up as a burnt offering. He makes a vow. Now, vows are unheard of. There's plenty of examples in the Old Testament that talk about vows and how you make vows to the Lord. Now, Jesus in the New Testament says that you know, we, sh- we should just simply let our yes be yes. But there's a long history of vow and oath-making to the Lord. But Jephthah makes such an odd vow, doesn't he? What does he say? He says, God, I, I need your help to win this battle. And it's almost like he's negotiating with God. He says, in fact, God, if, if you will help us to win this battle, then, then I will offer a, a sacrifice to you. Now, some, some commentators think that he must have been talking about an animal. That would make sense. Old Testament's filled with animal sacrifices. But the problem is, he says that whoever comes out to meet me, I will offer as a sacrifice to you. And I don't know about the animals back in the day, but my hunch is that cows didn't walk out the front door to greet people when they got back from war. He is most likely talking about a human which shows you something about the pagan influence that had infected not only Jephthah, but all of Israel. Such that he would say, God, if you will help us win this battle, I will offer a human sacrifice to you. And maybe he thought it would be one of these slaves of his or soldiers of his. Shoot, he probably thought one one of his brothers would walk out the door. Thank you, Lord. Take him. He's thinking about a human and so he's, he's making a, a bet with God. Now, remember when A.W. Tozer said that the most important thing about you is what you think about God? What did, what did Jephthah think about God? Well, even in that vow, I think we see a couple deductions that Jephthah made about God that were not, well, they're not true. Like, for instance, I think, number one, he, he thinks God has to be bribed. God has to be bribed. We... We, uh, we sometimes do that, don't we? God, if, if, if I do this, then you will do whatever. We have uh, a residence program at our church, and I, lo- I love the men and women that come to that, just young leaders like a lot of you that we feel privileged to invest in. Many of them uh, end up staying on our team. It's just, we, we love the residency program. We had a guy this year. He's new, and in our first little you know, like get-together kind of deal, we're talking about life and stuff, and they're going sharing their story. And he talked about, uh, you know, uh, he's getting married. And I thought, man, that's awesome. You know, you get married, engaged, wonderful. How'd you meet your wife? He said, well, I, uh, I told the Lord that I was going to tithe 20% if he gave me a woman. And I did, and he gave me the woman. I thought, I'm just going to go right by that right now. We'll come back and fix that later. But we, we tend to think about that, don't we? Like, if, if, I, uh, if I do this, then, God, you're obligated to do that. That's what Jephthah thinks. i got to bribe God. I, I think Jephthah thought that uh, favor has to be earned. Like, it's not enough just to trust God and say, hey, God, would you help us win this battle? It's like, no, i gotta, I got to do something really hard to prove to you, God. And I think, thirdly, this vow demonstrates that, that he doesn't fully trust God. He thinks that somewhere God is going to give up on him halfway through the battle. So he makes this vow. And I'm sure that he makes the vow and he thinks nothing of it. Big deal. Men die in war. It happens. Well, what will happen? Look at verse 32. 
So Jephthah crossed over to the sons of Ammon to fight against them. And the Lord handed them over to him. He inflicted a very great defeat on them from Aror to the entrance of Meneth, 20 cities as far as the Abel Keramim, or however you choose to mispronounce that word. So the sons of Ammon were subdued before the sons of Israel. <laughs> it worked. They, they won the war. They, I mean, they, they defeated them. Big time. The Hebrew word actually for defeat here is the word tail whooping. That, that's what it means. That, that, he, that he wins this war. Can you imagine the fanfare for Jephthah? I mean, surely he was thinking, I don't know, this plan is going to work, guys. But it, it worked, and they won the war, and all of a sudden he's thinking about all the power and the prestige. I mean, they said, if you win this war, if you defeat the Ammonites, you're going to now be in charge. He's probably thinking about all the fame and fortune that's coming his way. Oh, it's going to be a big parade when he gets home. Oh, yeah, but what about that vow? Now, who do you, you think is going to be the one to come out that door? Well, let's find out which of his servants it was. Verse 34. But Jephthah came to his house at Mitzvah, and behold, his daughter was coming out to meet him with tambourines and with dancing. And she was his one and only child. Besides her, he had no son or daughter. So when he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Oh, my daughter, you have brought me disaster, and you are among those who trouble me, for I have given my word to the Lord, and I cannot take it back. Can you imagine You know, I'm a, I'm a girl dad. I love having girls. Sometimes they drive me nuts, but I, I love my girls. In fact, my oldest daughter came down the stairs of the night, and she was dressed up for something. And I, I almost hate to admit this, but, like, I, I started tearing up. And I just said, you're, you're beautiful. You're beautiful. Every now and then, Tarek and I, you know, we'll get those little memories that pop up on your phone of, of past pictures. And I, I just think about pictures of our daughters doing the fun things and dressing up. And, you know, the time just goes by so quick. Could you imagine that the first person to come out your door was your daughter? He made a vow to the Lord. He was grieved now, I, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, surely there's another way. Sure, surely this doesn't honor the Lord. I think we have a hard time appreciating just the power of words. You know, we live in a day and age where people always try to find their way out of commitments they make. But at this time, if you say something, you do it. I want you to notice just the incredible strength and resilience of this young woman. Verse 35. Uh, 36, excuse me. So she said to him, My father, you have given your word to the Lord. Do to me just as you have said, since the Lord has brought you vengeance on your enemies, the sons of Ammon. And she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Allow me two months so that I may go to the mountains and weep because of my virginity, I and my friends. Then I said, Go. And she so he let her go for two months, and she left with her friends and wept on the mountains because of her virginity. And at the end of two months, she returned to her father, who did to her what he had vowed. And she had no relations with a man. And it became a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went annually to commemorate the daughter of Jephthah the Gileadite for four days in a year. It's a tragic story. And the worst part about this story is that vow. And you know what the worst part of that vow is? You know what it is? It's that he never had to make it. He never had to make it. God never instructed him to make the vow. God never required him to make the vow. 
but in his own warped thinking and theology, he made the vow. What's even worse is that according to a couple of chapters in the Bible, like Leviticus 27, there was a way to get out of the vow that he made to the Lord. But he did what he committed to do. What do we make about Jephthah? Do you think he's in heaven? Interesting that in Hebrews 11, when it goes through all the hall of faith, you know, all the Moses and Abraham and David, you know, all, all, Jephthah is right there, Hebrews 11, verse 32, in the hall of faith. Which says something about faith, doesn't it? That we are saved by grace through faith. That's what Ephesians 2 tells us, that it is by grace through faith that you have been saved. And this is not of yourselves, this is a gift of God, not by works that no one can boast. Now, I told you that I think this has something to do with why you came to Boyce. You might be thinking, what in the world does this have to do with me coming to Boyce College? I think it's this principle. Faith will get you into heaven. But if you don't truly know the Word of God and the author of the Word of God, you'll make a lot of dumb mistakes. This story shows us not only this, that, that someone can use their skills to be used for the Lord, but how their skills can get them into trouble. And this is where I'm going to get to you. Your ignorance of God will turn you into an idiot for God. Your ignorance for God will turn you into an idiot for God. And if you're not careful, it can do a lot of damage. Expertise matters. If I go to a doctor, I want to know that that doctor has trained and they know what they're doing. If, if I go to someone to fix my car, I want to know that person is trained and is skilled and able to fix my car. If I go to an attorney and need an attorney, I want an attorney who is trained and is credible and is able to do the things that I have hired that attorney to do. And the same is true of you. There's a man by the name of Mark Knoll. Uh, he was at Notre Dame for a long time. He, he wrote a book a couple of years ago called The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. And he said this in the first sentence of the book. He said, the scandal of the evangelical mind is there, there is not much of an evangelical mind. And his point was that we have become so enamored in our day of feelings and emotions that we need to counter that with sharp theological thinking about who God is and what He wants and what He has revealed in His Word. I, I want to challenge you uh, because I don't think anyone's going to walk out here and think about, you know what, I think I might make some vows in my life. I think that's the takeaway of this story. I need to make more vows. Maybe I could kill somebody in my dorm tonight. Maybe that's... Uh, I, I don't... Uh, if that's your problem, you have bigger issues than, you know. But, but I actually do think there's some lessons in this story for you to think about you as an undergrad at Boyce College. I want you to think about three particular areas and how God is going to require you to do, to do hard work to know Him and to be sharp theologically so that you make good decisions and you bring Him glory and honor with your life. The first is just your walk, your walk with God. How is your, work, your walk with God? How many days are you spending unhurried time with Jesus? It's, it's easy in, in an institution like this where you have settings like this, and you have teachers that pray before class, and you're challenged to study the Bible, it's, it, it is so easy to let your walk with God slip to the side. But, but I want to challenge you to think sharply about who God is, to think deeply about he, who He is, and to drink deeply from the well of, of what God has revealed in His Word, to know Him truly, so that, that, that you honor Him with your life. You know, God told us in His Word that we are to love Him, yes, with our heart, yes, with our, straw, our soul, yes, with our strength, but also what? With our mind. There, there's a connection between you knowing God and your heart being on fire for God. The deep connection between the two. So that the reason that you are to know God more is that 
is that you have more of God in your life. And you experience His power and His Spirit, your walk. Why else do I think you need to know God in a powerful way? Number two, your witness. Your witness. You know why most people don't share their faith? You know why? Because you, you won't give away what you don't have. You know what we need? We, we need a bunch of you to graduate from here and to go out and be the most joy-filled, theologically sharp, winsome, yet direct with the gospel evangelist. Because your life has been changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you, you can't help but to do the most natural thing, which is to share this hope and this life that you have found in Christ. Do you know God at such a level that you, you can't help but to talk about him with those that you're around in your life? So many Christians that I, that I know uh, do not have a vibrant daily walk with Christ. It shows up first and foremost in our witness. So your walk, your witness, and your work. That's the third area of your work. And, and I want to think about this both with your future and with your present. Let me start with the, with the future. We're living in a day and age where there are a number of ethical questions that are going to be placed upon you. In many respects, you, you will have a more difficult task of walking with Jesus than your parents did, and certainly your grandparents. And it's because, as the metaphor has often been used, we are the way team in this generation. We're not the home team. They're not wearing our jersey. We don't come in workplace like, oh, finally the Christian's here. Yay! They don't do that. We're the away team. And there are all kinds of ethical questions. I, I think the question of our age is what is a human being? And I think it shows up uh, with issues like artificial intelligence. I think it shows up with issues, of course, like abortion and euthanasia and a whole number of, of issues. Um, you're going to face questions about sexuality and God's design for sexuality and marriage and the institution of marriage and the propagation of marriage and children. We're going to have even more complex issues about warfare, drone warfare. There's a whole host of issues about the environment that I think Christians are not thinking very deeply about. And what's it mean not to, to dominate the earth, but to have a, a God-instilled dominion of the earth? And, and these are but a few of, the, of a number of ethical questions that you are going to have to deal with. And, and if you're not careful and you think, well, I don't want to deal with that, then you'll be like Jephthah and, and you'll make promises to God that aren't built upon the promises that God has already made to you. So, so your work, your future work, whether you are an attorney or a teacher or a pastor or anywhere in between, will require you in this season of your life to do sharp theological work to understand God. And, and that's more future, I get it. But in the present, I think it means that you need to take school really seriously. God doesn't love you because of the grades that you get. You don't have to earn God's favor by getting straight A's. But college is this wonderful bubble of a time, yes, to be with people, yes, to discover your identity and calling, yes, to be in community with others. But this is also a time for you to be sharpened theologically. And you're at a great place to do that. I, I look out at you and, and I and see so much promise for the future of, of our country, for the future of the world, for the future of, of what God wants to do in and through you. Again, faith will get you into heaven. But if you don't know that Bible, you can make a lot of dumb mistakes. Amen? Amen. Father, I just thank you for the chance to be here tonight, and I thank you for Jesus Christ and the power of your gospel. Lord God, we can't earn salvation. Lord, we are granted it and this amazing grace that we have through faith in Christ. Thank you for dying on the cross for our sins. Thank you for being our substitutionary atonement. Thank you for 
for rising from the dead, that, God, we have the promise of eternal life. And, Lord, thank you that right now the Holy Spirit indwells our life, our heart, our hands, but he also indwells our heads. And, Father, I pray that we would be a generation that takes you seriously, that we stand out in the most compelling of ways because, God, we have received your word. And, Lord, we want to be sharpened by it. God, I pray a blessing over every single student here as they begin this new semester. God, would you use them in powerful ways beyond what they can ask, think, or imagine, and would their lives bring you glory by how they love you with their mind. And Lord, we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.